Podcast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Chris and I are talking to Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and she joined us for actually about a one-hour session a couple of weeks back at the International UFO Congress in Scottsdale, Arizona, near Phoenix. And we had a fascinating discussion, and we briefly talked about the book that she and Philip Lombrogno wrote called The Vengeful Gin. And I have to caution you, this is not about the stuff that you put in a bottle and drink, although the legend does have something to do sometimes with something in a bottle, doesn't it? So I'm going to ask that silly question again, Rosemary, kind of to bring us back where we were a couple of weeks back, so listeners who didn't hear that show will know what we're talking about here. The gin is the legend behind the genie, right? It is, yes. Uh, the term gin means the hidden ones, and it refers to a an ancient race of supernaturally empowered beings who once lived on this planet before we came along, uh, and they lost out to us. They were pushed off this world into another one, which in modern terms would be a parallel dimension. They exist in a very ancient mythology and folklore as formidable beings who have the power to cause people a lot of problems. And our book, The Vengeful Jinn, is the case that we make for them being very active in the world today, not just in remote geographical regions or any particular spot in the country, but everywhere, and that they have an agenda for wanting to interact with us. Some of them may be hostile and aggressive in terms of wanting this world back for themselves. When you said that, something just occurred to me, which is, how did we gain control if they're so powerful? How did we supplant them or replace them? First of all, we have to know about them, and uh, they're very prominent in Middle Eastern folklore and mythology and even modern-day superstitions and practice because they originated in very ancient lore in the Middle East. But they really didn't enter Western mythology except through the magical tradition, which isn't known to very many people. And uh, also they became kind of trivialized from our translation of the Arabian folk tales, like Aladdin and the Magical Lamp. We think of them as genies in a bottle or a lamp. They've always been portrayed, well, for the most part at least, in the media as with a humorous twist, uh, entities that that have been imprisoned in these vessels and come out and have to grant you wishes. But actually, they are very formidable supernatural entities who have the capability of shape-shifting into many forms uh, and interacting uh, with us in a, a variety of ways. And we believe that they take on the disguises of other entities so that um, many times we really don't know what we're dealing with and they can pursue their own agendas without us realizing it. Maybe I wasn't clear about my question question here, but what I'm saying is here, you're saying this is an ancient race of beings that was here before humanity, and then they went off to another dimension. So the question I had, and I'm trying to understand, is how were they consigned to the other dimension? Can you answer that? You want me to answer that? Well, you go ahead, Phil, because I've had a couple there. Oh, okay. Well, they were the stewards of this planet this dimension, this physical physical existence. They developed a technology, according to the story. They developed a, uh, um, they became very powerful. They warred among each other. They polluted the environment. They were on the verge of self-destruction. Now, according to, you know, in the beliefs, in the Muslim beliefs, and even the Persian beliefs, and the you know, stories, a higher order of being, you can call them whatever you want, extraterrestrials, angels, or whatever, came down and stopped what they were doing and isolated them so the species would not extinguish itself. And they were put sort of like in protective custody. And most of them gave up the world and willingly went, but some of them stood by and had a war against, let's say, the angels or whatever you want to call them, this higher order of being. And um, then finally they lost that war and they were isolated in this parallel dimension where they could do very little harm. Now, as time went on, some of them interacted with human beings. At one time in history, um, especially during the time of King Solomon, somewhere around 4,000 years ago or so, 5,000 years ago or so, the jinn were more prominent and interacted with the human race. Uh, there was more interaction. 
as, and as time went on, more of them became isolated from humans. And the overall goal, goal of most of some of these jinn, as we call the vengeful jinn, is that they don't like where they are, and they'd rather be back in this world. But if you think about it, I mean, this is almost like a lesson in morality. The jinn became very powerful. They polluted the planet. They warred among each other. They were on the verge of self-destruction. It almost sounds like the human race at this point of time. So uh, that's the story on how they were taken. Human beings did not take them out, did not isolate them, even though human beings, some humans, were given control over some jinn. Some jinn were so powerful that they had to be imprisoned. And uh, this is where you get the idea of the, the jinn in the ring or the jinn in the, the bottle encased by iron, or in some cases, jinn encased, imprisoned in certain caves in the Middle East. If that answers your question. Chris? One place I think that we should start is looking at the similarities between the whole concept of the jinn and the concept of Lucifer and the fallen angels. Um, we have some very interesting parallels, which you point out in the beginning of your book. Um, Iblis uh, is considered to be one of the, if not the, um, mastermind behind uh, the gen agenda. And there are some very obvious parallels, I would say, between Iblis and Lucifer, uh, for instance. Um, do you want to uh, – let's look at the parallels between the Judeo-Christian sort of version um, and, and the, the Middle Eastern, the Islamic uh, traditions version, and look at similarities and then look – and see if we have a, an actual separation or if we're dealing with the same, the same thing. This is very important, I think, for our listeners to understand that there is, number one, I think, a separation between the two categories of, of shape-shifting uh, supernatural uh, class of entities and, um, or alleged, if you were, for our <laughs> skeptics out there. And I, I think that we need to kind of give our listeners a sense of the distinction between the two and the similarities. Well, I'm going to let Rosemary answer that. To I'll, say that one. One, I'll say one thing about it. In Islam, there are no fallen angels. The angels were made pure of the purest light, so they're uncorruptible. They have no free will. But the jinn did have free will, and they um, and, and and the devil is is a jinn. So, you know, I'm going to let Rosemary take it from there. Uh, well, Chris, there are some very important similarities and differences, and um, many people confuse the jinn with demons because um, the ones that are interacting with us the most are hostile and aggressive, and uh, they're often called devils. So people think they're one and the same, but the jinn are not demons. The uh, jinn were absorbed into Islam, even though they pre-existed Islam, and the creation story that's told in the Quran uh, explains, uh, as Phil just mentioned, that the angels were created from pure spiritual light, the jinn from smokeless fire, which in modern terms would be plasma. The, uh, the angels were created from pure spiritual light, the jinn from smokeless fire, which is plasma, and then along came humans. When God created humans, he told the angels to bow down to them, and the angels, having no free will, complied. But the leader of the jinn, Iblis, who was in heaven, uh, refused. He said human beings were not worthy. They were less than him, and he would not bow down. For that, God cursed him and his kind and cast them out. I'll tell you what, we'll um, get into more of this in a moment. Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Philip Imbrogno, we're talking about gins, and this is not a show about liquor. I'm going to keep emphasizing that. It's about very strange, powerful, supernatural creatures. Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in The Paracast. <laughs>
Jacques Vallée, Bud Hopkins, Brad Steiger, Nick Redfern, Lauren Coleman. You'll find classic and new books by these and many other authors at Anomalous Books, the number one publisher of 14 books on the planet. They specialize in books on UFOs and aliens, Bigfoot and cryptozoology, parapsychology and the paranormal, as well as alternative history, all of which makes Anomalous Books simply phenomenal. Check out their catalog at AnomalousBooks.com. That's A-N-O-M-A-L-I-S-T Books.com. Jim Newcomer from Midas Resources, April 1st, 2011. Gold opened this morning at 1434.20. A one ounce gold coin can be purchased for 1471.04, 735.52 for a half ounce, or 367.76 for a quarter ounce. That's 1471.04, 735.52, and 367.76. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights have been reduced to old relics politicians ignore, trample with their outlandish, overreaching policies. Your support of the Campaign for Liberty stands in the way of this insidious process. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I've teamed up with the Campaign for Liberty to offer the authentic proof quarter ounce pure gold coin. For only $390 plus shipping, Midas will donate $100 to this incredible organization. Help fight big government by ordering your gold coin at 800-686-2237. You get to win twice by owning gold and fighting an overreaching government. Call 800-686-2237. Again, that's 800-686-2237. Alex has told you that the Mideast uprisings over food prices and shortages caused by fuel costs are spreading worldwide. We're seeing the impact right here in the United States. Ethanol that was supposed to reduce petroleum use and fuel prices hit a 30-month high in February, and pump prices are expected to reach $5 a gallon. Because of shipping costs, food is being priced out of the reach of millions of Americans with an expected 35% jump in the next 60 days. Move quickly while you can still afford it, and eFoods Direct will pay your shipping costs for you. For the best-tasting, long-term storable food, you pay nothing for shipping and can put every dollar into food at today's prices. eFoods Direct, food so delicious you can serve it tonight or save it for the future. Take advantage of free shipping by calling 800-409-5633. On the web, eFoodsDirect.com slash Alex, 800-409-5633 or eFoodsDirect.com slash Alex. Did you know that drinking pure, high alkaline water is one of the most important factors in maintaining high energy and vibrant health? Most experts agree that the water you drink should be at a pH level of 8 or higher. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops, available only at AlkaVision.com, combine a unique formula of only the most alkaline minerals. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops alkalize your water, ridding the body of harmful toxins, and helps you regain health and energy. Alkalizing your water by simply adding 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops helps the body rid itself of acidic waste, increases oxygen content, and raises the pH of your body to healthy levels. And bacteria and viruses cannot survive in an alkaline high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops for only $29.95 at AlkaVision.com. That's A-L-K-A-Vision.com. Or call 269-409-1776. 269-409-1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com today. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com Get in on all the action at forum.theparacast.com We return searching for the vengeful gin with Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip Imbrogno. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. And we've had a few glitches, I think, carryovers from that strange interview we did with Richard Souter. On the previous week's episode, where we the had Ecuadorian the wasps, mosquito. I thought it was wasps myself. Yeah. You know? Oh boy! Yeah. So go ahead, Chris. Well, okay. Uh, yeah, we're back in the saddle here. I'm not sure how you pronounce the name of um, Azazel, but uh, Iblis, I think, is the other uh, term that's uh, applied to the once powerful angel that uh, I think we were referring to before. 
And one of the things that I find very interesting is um, the whole thing in Leviticus 16 in the Bible, in verse 9, where God tells Moses that his brother Aaron should take two goats and sacrifice them, one for the Lord for sin and the second for Azazel. And this is one of our earliest real indications of a master gen, if you will, in terms of documentation in some sort of written down form. And this is, I think, where, as you point out in the book, where the jinn are often equated with desert areas because these uh, atonements or these sacrifices were, were sent out to the desert. Now, this also brings up the classification of jinn. We do have jinn that are a lot different than other jinn, according to the traditional knowledge. And uh, if uh, one or both of you could comment on this very interesting classification system that has kind of arisen through the uh, through the millennia of how the jinn are actually divided into categories, this is very fascinating. Phil, do you want to take that one? Well, yeah, I can I can start on it, and you can finish it. You see, human beings know very little about jinn, and the only thing that we know is what we found out by accident. Some jinn talk too much or some information leaks over. At one time, we knew much more about them than we do now. But jinn have families. The family unit is small. All their relatives belong to clans. Clans are ruled by powerful jinns, and they're all ruled by jinn kings. They have their own social structure. They have their own accountability. For example, not all jinn are evil. In Islam, for example, um, the evil jinn are referred to as devils. You have to remember, they're like human beings. There's many likes and many dislikes. You're dealing with an individual. And what people have a tendency to do when they think about jinn, they think about the entire race and, and lump them all into one category and one mentality. That's not true. They're individuals. You have psychotic jinn. Hope you never run into one. You have curious childlike jinn who are actually you know, thousands of years old, and you have very powerful noble jinn, which very rarely interact with the human race. But you see, in the, in, in the old days in the, in, in the Persian folklore, if something was not an angel or angelic in nature and was not a human, they were considered jinn in between. They started identifying that there are different types of jinn. And where you go in, your, in the country, wherever, wherever Middle Eastern country you go to, you'll hear different names. And that can be very, very confusing because there's probably 20, 30, 40, 50 different names for jinn. And it depends upon the country you're in. But if you go back to the root of the Persian belief, they divide them into certain types of ranks or colors. You'll see the early representations of these jinn, blue jinn further away, with blue skin. But it really has nothing to do with the color of their skin. It has something to do with, with our identification of their rank, which is very powerful. And green jinn, which are very, very young, and yellow jinn, which are in between. So the blue jinn are the elders, the very powerful ones that were around at the, uh, the fall of the jinn that were around. That Remember, the green jinn are are less powerful. Most of them are young. You see, in the jinn ranks, the older they are, you assume that the more knowledge they get. They're not born with power that they can do anything. Like human beings, they have to learn how to manipulate this power. For example, as we go to school and we learn more things, we become more knowledgeable and more powerful ourselves. But there are people who go through their entire life and they'll go past a high school education or a sixth grade education in some cases, and um, they never reach a certain level, and they never seek additional knowledge. The jinn have to do the same thing. They have probably training sessions, schools, and so on, where they teach people how to use their abilities, and they teach their people how to manipulate matter and energy. And not all jinn have the same power. Some are definitely more capable than others. So when you look at jinn, you know, you have to look at them as individuals and not as, as the sum of the whole, as one mentality, because they're not. A question here, Philip. Do they look like humans? Are they human-like or what? I mean, we think of the pictures we see, of course, in the movies of genie, sometimes they're human, sometimes they're, as they say, a little bit monstrous. What's or, the truth? Blue-colored well, yeah. Robin Williams. <laughs> Robin Williams, yeah, yes. I mean, oh, well, that's, that's the ultimate gin. 
Yes, but you know, you have to remember that jinn, according to the Quran, are actually made of smokeless fire, which to me, you know, sounds like plasma, which means they have really no form. Their form is, seems to be contained by magnetic fields. And they can manipulate the shape of the magnetic field to manipulate their shape. They have the ability, for example, to take certain forms of matter, certain forms of, of plasma, certain forms of matter, and change it into other forms. And to us, we understand this process today, although we can't do it. But back then, the ability of a jinn to do this was magic. They could take on different forms, but they can't hold forms. The more powerful and the more trained the jinn is, the longer he can keep a form or she can keep a, a certain type of form. They can take the form of animals. Most of them will take the form of humans, reptilian-like creatures, monster-like creatures. When they take human form, most of them are very beautiful looking, if they want to be. But according to what I understand when I was in the Middle East, is that they have a problem with one form, and that's maintaining the shape of the human eye. Jinn eyes are yellow, and they're almost snake-like. They have one problem, they can't hold the shape of the eyes, and the eyes revert back to the jinn. So this is how they say how you can identify a human who is a jinn. Sooner or later, if you're around them long enough, the eyes are going to flicker back and forth into a jinn eyes. Or maybe so, they'll always wear sunglasses. Well, that's what I'm saying now. I mean, there are people walking around in the Middle East, you know, wearing, wearing sunglasses all the time, like the Terminator, for example. He had the red eyes. So he wore the sunglasses. So this is the same sort of thing where, you know, the jinn they say are in this world in human form and they wear sunglasses so that people can identify them even if people did i mean if you walk down in new york city and you're walking down in a very strange individual and your eyes flash the yellow with people walk by you and they wouldn't even care well in new york there's so, so many weird people that it doesn't matter if somebody's an et it's a gin or or anything else it wouldn't make a well, difference a gin can, a gin sure. can you know interface with this world and, and especially in the united states and go unnoticed but in the middle east it's a different story i want to you ask know, you more about this in a moment we have Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Philip Imbrogno. We're talking about the vengeful gin and why they're vengeful. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then, a coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack! Attack! Of the Rockwells. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes, The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans a galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack, Attack of the Rockoids is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Attack, Attack. Of the Rockwell, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. The food storage industry leader has done it again. Introducing FDG Clubs and Survival Bucks from the Freeze Dry Guy. For over 39 years, the Freeze Dry Guy has served various government agencies and the private sector with the finest in storable foods and emergency rations. If you've wanted to build emergency food supplies but couldn't afford it, now you can. Go to freezedryguy.com, click on products, and look for the Freeze Dry Guy Clubs to pay as you go. Now you can build food storage without going into debt. Choose from a payment range of $95 to $450 per month. 
month. Our clubs work with everyone's budget. Plus, when you join Freeze Dry Guy clubs, you'll get additional rewards. For example, this month, get 10% back in survival bucks on all purchases in the Freeze Dry Guy product line, plus free shipping within the lower 48 states on any order amount. Hurry, go to freezedryguy.com or call 866-404-3663. That's freezedryguy.com or call 866-404-3663. The Freeze Dry Guy, the best you can buy. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over five years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey light systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light System today, complete with two black Berkey elements for only $220. And the Berkey Guy will include three sport Berkey water bottles and ship everything to you free of charge. That's right, three sport Berkey water bottles and free shipping. An $87 value, yours free. Call the Berkey Guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653. Or order online at GoBerkey.com. That's GoBerkey.com today. It's the winter cold and flu supplement sale at HerbalHealer.com. Take advantage of Herbal Healer Academy's incredible savings on the best cold and flu supplements available. Many of you know elderberry is exceptional against viral infections. Right now, Herbal Healer Academy has elderberry power. Regularly priced at $16.95, now incredibly low at only $10 for 60 vegetarian caps. For children and seniors, our Herbal Healer Academy Flu Away Elderberry Liquid is only $13 for a 4-ounce bottle. Also on super sale, olive leaf capsules, oregano oil plus capsules, and our incredible Respirate formula, Oregacillin Physician Strength Capsules for your lungs. Normally $34.95, now just $25. Hit the winter specials link at HerbalHealer.com for these cold and flu supplement specials and other on-sale products like apple cider vinegar, brain power, and neuro recovery. New customers get a free catalog with your first order. Log on and hit the winter specials now at HerbalHealer.com. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Hi, this is nuclear physicist lecturer Stanton Friedman. You are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We're returning with... Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip Imbrogno. We're talking about vengeful gins. What are they here for? Are they real? Later on, Chris O'Brien, our co-host, will ask the questions you listeners asked in the Paracast forums at forum.paracast.com. But I'll ask the obvious skeptics question, okay? We think of genies, gin, whatever, as the stuff of legends, fanciful stories, Aladdin's magic lamp, Barbara Eaton as I Dream of Genie. So for people who don't believe in this kind of stuff, how do you prove it to them? Rosemary, you want to start with that? I never try to prove the paranormal or anything supernatural to anyone because the skeptics will hold out and not believe until they have an experience that convinces them otherwise. To people who sit on the fence, I say, well, you can't really cherry pick the paranormal. You can't allow yourself to believe in something like fairies or angels or even demons or ghosts then feel that some other part of the paranormal couldn't possibly exist. If we're going to study these entity encounters, which clearly human beings have been having throughout our our history, then we have to be open to all possibilities. Our entity encounters are told through our mythologies and our folklore. I think one thing that Western people may have difficulty with concerning the jinn is that the folklore never really became part of our Western folklore. It's Middle Eastern folklore that uh, still seems very remote and surreal to a lot of people in the West. But it's just as real as folklore about the fairies, our ghost stories, and our current mythology concerning extraterrestrial encounters. I'll ask that obvious question. Does the jinn have anything to do with what we perceive as UFOs? Any relationship? Well, absolutely. One of the things that we do in the vengeful jinn. We just is... lost Chris again. Hang on. Chris, did you make your wishes? 
to the gym. <laughs> okay. Wish number one. I wish for a good connection. Oh, yeah. You may not get it. Don't say that. <laughs> We know this is interesting here. Normally, we only have occasional problems with the technology. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of technology, satellite, whatever, there are going to be problems. Now, Chris is maybe, what, 120 or 130 miles away from me, and we normally have a pretty good connection, but today Always. he's had troubles maintaining a good connection. So, mm. but the point is here, we think of Jen, Rosemary, and Philip, I guess, as mischievous. Now, are they just playing pranks on us, or maybe... In Chris's parlance, are they tricksters, or they have a higher purpose in mind? There is a significant trickster element to the jinn, and from their very ancient folklore, they are renowned for being deceitful, tricky, uh, stealthy, and looking for ways, basically, to interfere with human beings and undercut them. Uh, and, of course, if they are wronged, uh, they can be uh, quite vengeful. Uh, and this is an element that exists in a lot of our paranormal experiences uh, across the board. Well, let, let's get back to the historical um, elements before we move on and, and kind of equate the gen into a more modern context. One of the things that I've always been fascinated by are the legends surrounding King Solomon, of course, the son of David, who, it is said, was able to corral the jinn and was able to control them uh, to the extent where they actually helped build the, uh, you know, the first real, um, you know, temple of Jerusalem. Can we talk about that a little bit and how Solomon, I think, uh, as a historical character, appears to be a crucial kind of um, conjunction in uh, belief systems between the um, idealized Western pop culture version and the more traditional Islamic version. King Solomon is one of the um, main ways that the jinn entered Western folklore uh, through the magical tradition. He's a legendary figure uh, and somewhat historical. There isn't too much uh, really known about him. He was said to live about 1000 B.C. Uh, he was the second king of Israel. He was the son of David. When he assumed the kingship, uh, God asked him what he would like, uh, what sort of gift he would like, and he asked for discernment. Uh, so God granted him great wisdom and uh, power uh, because he was seeking discernment rather than something to glorify himself. One of the things that he was able to do uh, was command the jinn, and this was through a magical ring that also was a gift of God that enabled him to summon them, uh, cause them to reveal their names, which is a in magic a form of uh, command and control. And then he enslaved them to build the Temple of Jerusalem, and in some accounts, the entire city of Jerusalem, uh, for which they complained and felt they suffered mightily, and they were enslaved uh, until his death. The magic that he is said to have used to control the jinn became incorporated in a book called The Greater Key of Solomon, which does have some ancient roots going back to about the first century uh, CE and has been handed down throughout the centuries in various magical texts called grimoires. These are texts for conjuring and uh, summoning spirits. It's often translated as spirits or angels or demons in uh, our Western translations, never as jinn, which was the original. And uh, these are handbooks that um, have astrological uh, information in them, all of the incantations, magical seals, symbols, uh, and instructions for controlling these spirits who were originally the jinn. Well, we have an interesting parallel uh, down in the Maya traditions of the uh, uh, Alukes, who supposedly were able to build the Temple of the Magician at Ushmal overnight. And uh, do you see any, uh, with your work, I mean, obviously you've, you've uh, I mean, the two of you are <laughs> pretty amazing in terms of the amount of research you've done into these legendary type forms that seem to be manifesting, you know, today in the modern world to, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on how skeptical you are. But uh, do you see parallels with uh, other uh, traditional systems of knowledge, for instance, the Maya and this, uh, this tradition of, of dwarf-like, uh, almost jinn-like entities being able to build a whole temple uh, in a single night. Well, we see a lot of similarities uh, between the descriptions of the jinn and descriptions of other kinds of entities 
Uh, we've compared them to fairies, uh, demons, shadow people, mysterious creatures, extraterrestrials. And we're not saying that these other entities don't exist in their own right, but the jinn uh, could infiltrate among these entities as a way of uh, trying to get back into this world yet remaining hidden. So there are some definite parallels and the question then is uh, how do we know uh, what's what? Uh, how do we discern among the ver various entities that we're interacting with? And uh, these are some of the questions that we wanted to raise with the book to get people thinking about the true nature of our supernatural encounters and per the purposes behind them. For example, considering the ETs, uh, we've got the ETs who seem to be abducting us and having uh, a hybridization program going on. Well, could the jinn be involved in that? In lore, they are capable of um, intermingling with and, and mating with human beings to produce offspring. So they could have their own program going on, but as a masquerade, we're thinking it's all ETs and it may not be, for example. Well, you're both, I mean, admirable seasoned field investigators, uh, and I must underscore that. You're not just sitting in your armchairs uh, <laughs> researching arcane fact, uh, you know, fact, if you can call them facts uh, in the historical tradition. Um, as field investigators going out into the field now, uh, armed with this whole new set of research that you've really uh, obviously, you know, you've, you've dove into the pool uh, of the gin, and I'm wondering, how do you differentiate? Like, let's say you go out to a haunted site, and and you have inexplicable phenomena occurring, and and, and potential entities uh, in terms of uh, you know your average interpretation. How would you differentiate between a standard, uh, let's say, uh, ghost uh, that's some sort of residual type uh, spirit or entity and, and something that's conscious and, and self-determined like a gen. Before we have the answer to that question, we have Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Philip M. Brockno, I'm Gene Steinberg, Chris O'Brien's the co-host. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many files formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. <laughs> Are you still a traditional smoker? Now experience a new lifestyle and try vaping with e-cigarettes by LeSig. Imagine no ashes, stains, nasty smell, or coughing and hacking. With LeSig e-cigarettes, revolutionary microelectronic technology, rechargeable battery, and unique replaceable cartridge, you'll get all the benefits and satisfaction of smoking without the hazards. Choose your taste from a wide variety of our new American-made Vaporeate e-liquids at LeSig.com. And LeSig smokes the competition by serving thousands of worldwide customers with real people customer service, fast, free, same-day shipping, and a 30 day warranty and satisfaction guarantee. So are you ready for a new vaping lifestyle? Then call 870-518-4307. That's 870-518-4307. Or visit LeSig.com, spelled L-E-C-I-G.com. LeSig e-cigarettes for today's modern smoker. There's mounting evidence suggesting that there are people, governments, corporations, and whole professions intent on short-circuiting humanity's well-being. GMO, food legislation protecting big agriculture, the attempted elimination of vitamins and alternative medicines, it seems their hand has been tipped. They want to dictate your health, wealth, and your longevity. Whatever the outcome, we have a solution. Wild edible food. Why worry about food when all has been provided? 
We imagine that we were ejected from the garden and never invited back, but the garden's still here. There is an endless wild abundance which grows all over our green earth, just waiting for you to wake up and see it. Let author Linda Runyon teach you how to see, know, get, prepare, store, and eat wild edible food. Save money, add nutrition, and ignore the noise when you go shopping in nature's supermarket. Go to ofthefield.com and get started today. Or call 1-888-51-EAT-FREE. That's ofthefield.com or call 1-888-51-EAT-FREE and begin to see a different world. Normal blood pressure, naturally. How would that make you feel? I'm Don from New Mexico. January of 2000, I had a heart attack. Then my real health began going downhill, and I had uh, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, poor vision, and I really wasn't sleeping well. I was a mess, pretty much. Don reports dramatic improvements with heart and body extract. I started taking uh, heart and body extract, and from within a few days, I started sleeping a lot better. My blood pressure uh, normalized, my blood sugar normalized, and uh, my sleep really did improve. Experience these benefits and more when your body gets what it needs with the assistance of heart and body extract. Order at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305. That's hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305. Folks, I did not expect this at all. By the 7th, 8th, and 9th day, I saw dramatic improvements from taking heart and body extract. Details at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305 for heart and body extract. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. You're in the Paracast. You never know what's going to happen next. We seek the gin, or maybe we shouldn't seek the gin, I don't know. Of course, the book is The Vengeful Gin from Philip Ambrogno and Rosemary Ellen Guiley. And before our break, Chris O'Brien was asking a very long, detailed question, and I'll leave it up to Philip and Rosemary to decide who takes the question. Go for it. Well, if, if you go in the Middle East, they'll tell you that um, there are no UFOs, there are no ghosts, there are no demons, there are no fallen angels, there are only jinn. So how do you differentiate between other types of paranormal phenomena in the gin. Well, men are very crafty and they're very old. And um, if they want to hide themselves, there's no way that you're going to be able to identify them. But like humans, they have egos. They have a tendency to, after a while, expose themselves for who they really are. Most will engage in conversation after a while, and if they think they have the upper hand over the poor human, fool the human is their favorite game, uh, they will continue. So this is one way that you can identify any type of gin activity. Now, you have to remember, they don't have one mentality. If you're dealing with a, with a psychotic gin, he's going to act psychotic. It's going to act psychotic. If you're dealing with a young gin, it's going to act very childish. Many of the young gin, according to legend, like to appear in front of children and take on forms like what they expect, like storybook characters and so on and so on and they always say you know we should take into consideration and take more serious childhood you know uh, imaginary friends so-called imaginary friends so if you look at the entire paranormal it's very confusing i mean you have the ghost hunters out there you have the ufo people out there you have the bigfoot hunters out there and you know most of them don't agree with the other as to what are the origin of these phenomena but once you factor in the gin it puts in that element that uh, sort of makes it a little easier to understand. And, and, and I want to make it very clear that, you know, jinn are not magical beings. They are dimensional entities that use what we would consider the new ideas of physics to manipulate matter. Um, what they do and what they're capable of, uh, we're beginning to understand with new the new areas of theoretical physics. So it's not too far from, let's say, the beliefs of anyone that there, yes, there are these other dimensional existences out there, and and and, and there's no reason to assume that some of them are not inhabited by intelligent beings. Now, what the jinn call themselves, we don't know. That's the name we've given to the jinn. It means the hidden ones, because in the Middle East, in, in, in the Persian beliefs, they thought they were invisible because they could not be seen only if they wanted to be seen. But today, 
invisibility may mean that they exist in a parallel dimension, an area of space that we can't turn to see. Well, let's let's uh, kind of fast forward into into uh, the present day and uh, talk about uh, your trip actually uh, to the Middle East, Phil. Where you had quite a, an amazing field trip out to a particular <laughs> a particular location. Yeah, why, why don't why don't you give us a sense of what it's like to go as a field investigator to you know a foreign land to a place that has an ancient tradition of being a kind of a grand central station for these uh, this classification of entity. Why don't you give us a kind of a sense of what it's like to go chasing after them? Well, I, that was not my original uh, idea. I was over in Israel, and I kept on hearing about the jinn, the jinn, jinn, jinn. This, and I'm saying, what the heck is a jinn? And I was thinking about people, you know, oh, yes, the jinn. I was, because, you know, I was interested in UFOs back then. And I was doing a lot of field research in the UFOs back then. And, I, you know, so I just started asking around and making friends with people and so on. And a lot of people are very friendly there. And, and they kept on saying jinn. And I'm saying, my first thought was, you know, like you know, a later drink. Was people want gin? What are they talking about? Then I began to realize they were talking about genies. And of course, being a dumb Westerner, oh, I started laughing. They took this like, how could you be laughing at the gin? They're very, very serious. You know, I was thinking about, you know, Barbara Eden and, you know, Robin Williams and Aladdin's Lamp and all that and all this, you know, uh, Arabian Night stuff. And, and I began to realize that, that, you know, the people over there took it very serious. So to make a very long story short, I was uh, able to get into Saudi Arabia with no problem. Well, with some problems from Israel. It's a long comical story almost. And... Um, and I began to pick up more information on the jinn. I actually had dinner with a member and other people, of course, a member of the royal Saudi family. And as I'm sitting at the dinner table with a friend of mine who I served with in the military, who was a high-ranking officer in the Saudi royal family security force, I was sitting next to uh, the cousin of the prince and so on. The prince was supposed to be there, but he didn't show up. So the cousin showed up for the dinner as an ambassador. And he looked over to me and he said, you're an American. What do you do in my country? And I said, I'm, I'm tracking down and researching gin. I've got interest in it. And he yells on top of his lung, gin? He says, they are in my country. He says, your government is trying to capture one. Oh. He told me this amazing story about how there are governments of the world, the Saudi government, the United States, and European governments, and so on. They have special, a special unit, and they're out in the desert in these special operations, and they're trying to capture a jinn. And because they know, they know that jinn travel through the dimensional barriers, and they figure they're using some type of technology, they want to capture one to obtain this technology. Now, this is not the first time that I've heard this story. And I was really wow. amazed. And then, of course, he wouldn't talk to me anymore, but he referred me to a holy man who uh, was downtown in the other part of the poor part of this, the Saudi uh, of Riyadh. And you have to remember, there there are, there are two classes of people, the very rich and the very poor. And uh, this particular individual, I had a translator, and he told me the entire history of the jinn. So... From there, I ended up in Oman and uh, ended up at a place called Majas al Jinn, which means the cave of the jinn. Now, the interesting thing enough, originally that cave was called uh, the meeting place or the, the place of the goat. And once again, that ties in Azazel, the goat god, with the jinn, and so on and so on. But in that cave, um, it's supposed to be where the jinn enter our particular reality. And it's an amazing place. I mean, it's just not like a little cave. The only way that you can get into it is from the top, openings in the top. And it's so large in there that you could fit the pyramid, the big pyramid at Giza, inside the cavern and still have room. And this is how big it is. So from the top of the opening to the bottom is like 350 feet. And I had a guide and also my interpreter, and I went down, halfway down, and they were up, and they, were, they would not come in. They said to me, well, here's what you, here, 
here is where you must go alone, my friend. And I looked at them like, give me a break. I thought you were coming with me. Anyway, about halfway down, I hear them yelling. And, um, and of course, I can't understand what they're saying. They're speaking Arabic. And, but I heard the word jinn. And um, during that time, I could swear in the cave, I mean, the echoing and everything, I could swear I could hear a voice. And I couldn't understand what it was saying, but there was a green mist that was coming up from the bottom of the cave and rising up. And I look up, and my interpreter and my guide is gone. Now, now you're hanging on belay. I'm hanging. Uh, I'm repelling okay. down. I'm about 150 feet down. And they're up there screaming, and I see this mist coming up, and I, and I think I hear this voice that's speaking this language. But I'm not exactly sure because it was echoing in the cave, and they were rambling on an Arabic up there, and I didn't understand them, but I heard the word jinn. So I look up, and they're gone. And I'm saying to myself, i got to get back up there. So I'm climbing back up, and I come to the top of the opening, and they're running down the hill. And I'm saying, where are you going? And my interpreter yells back. He said, the jinn. He says, we have to get out of here. And, of course, they're ready to jump in the Jeep and take off. And I would be left somewhere in the Hadjar Mountains all by myself in America. So they wouldn't care. And, uh, they wouldn't care. They'd abandon you. They, they were, they were going to take, take off in the Jeep. And I would leave me there. They were so terrified. So I ran down and caught up with them and uh, got in the Jeep as they were taking off. And they were saying all these Arabic prayers on the way back. And my, uh, my guide who came with me from Saudi Arabia, he was a captain in the Saudi Army. And he was saying to me, I never believed. I heard legends. I heard stories. I never believed. But they are real. The jinn are real. So we went back to the town of Finn where... The people were very upset. The, our, our guide started telling them what happened, and the people got very upset with me because they said that I woke up a sleeping gin. I'll tell you what, you woke up the gin, upset. but we have to wake up our sponsors right now, otherwise they're going to be very upset. We have Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip M. Brockno. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in. The Pentecost. <laughs> Hi, Ted Anderson announcing a great way to listen to radio on the telephone. By calling 760-569-7700, you'll be hearing GCNlive.com programs in seconds. Come to GCNlive.com, find your favorite host's dedicated phone number, and hear them 24-7. You heard me right, every show has a dedicated phone number. Stop by GCNlive.com and bookmark their number today. And again, that's 760-569-7700. We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carding to a private bank, having it led back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Okay, if that's the kind of accent you're doing, Chris, please I was don't. trying to do an Arabic accent, accent but it didn't work. <laughs> don't Sorry. quit your day job. Okay. I think this is your day job, so we're stuck with that. Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Philip Imbrogno, we're talking about the gin. And it looks like possibly Philip came up close and personal to one of these creatures, but at least you got out of there safely. Have you had any other close encounters of this sort? Not me, no. I've encountered entities in some of my investigations that uh, we feel are quite certain are gin. And uh, you were asking a little earlier, you know, how do you know the difference? And sometimes it's by a process of elimination. It depends on the behavior of the entity, the kinds of um, things that it it acts out doing uh, against human beings. They tend to be, uh, if they're powerful enough, very resistant to efforts to dislodge them uh, or to exercise them. 
Um, they will engage in conversation, as, as Phil mentioned. Uh, we have some cases in our files that uh, we've been tracking for quite some time. Um, people who are living in what we call paranormal hot zones or portal areas where uh, there's a lot of different kinds of entity activities. And it seems that um, Jin are able to lodge in these areas and sort of have a, a foot in two worlds, so to speak, where they're in their own dimension and, and yet they can have a, a territorial hold in ours. They are behind haunting disturbances of tremendous magnitude. They can ha create ghost and poltergeist phenomena. They manifest as shadow people. Uh, we get EVP with them, electronic voice phenomena, mysterious lights, mysterious creatures, and uh, entities that some people would say are demonic. But they're, we stress that, you know, demons are not the same as, as jinn. So uh, sometimes um, people think that they're really dealing with demonic cases. And in fact, uh, we've discussed these with our demonologist friend, John Zaffis, who's one of the leading demonologists. Uh, around. He's been uh, investigating for about 30-some years, and he has many cases in his files that people thought were demons, but they just fell into uh, an unexplained category because the entities didn't behave like demons, and they couldn't be gotten rid of the way uh, we usually get rid of demons. So uh, it becomes very problematic sometimes to identify exactly what we're dealing with, especially when you have uh, a race of beings like the jinn who can shape shift into a variety of forms so they can keep changing their guise. The fast question occurs to me here, the jinn, is it all magic that they do things or do they have some kind of technology, some innate technology that they use to accomplish this? You know, some kind of highly advanced technology that allows for the shape shifting and all the other crazy things. Well, it's it's both. But it's not magic. They have uh, certain devices and certain uh, things um, which, um, which can manipulate matter and energy to a certain degree. Uh, for example, like I said, they have to understand, they have to learn, and they're taught the different arrangements of matter, how, 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 um, how strings create the elementary particles and how the elementary particles combine together to make protons and so on. They just can't snap their fingers and gold appears and something like that. They have to rearrange the strings and rearrange matter in order to change one form to another. Now, for the most part, most jinn, most of the powerful jinn and the, the advanced jinn, the, the knowledgeable jinn, they have the ability because they are a plasma and they have a certain amount of energy in a magnetic field to actually go into solid uh, molecular structure and rearrange the atomic structure into something that they want to turn it into. And um, in the old days, you know, Jim would grab uh, glass, hold it in its hand, and open its hand for the person, and it would be gold. And the person would say, oh, it's magic. But you see... Today, we can understand that one form of matter can be turned into another form by changing the vibration of the strings that make up the elementary particles in the universe. So we're actually catching up to the jinn. But, you see, according to what I understand and heard in the Middle East, jinn are very, very impressed with the human race. For example, they're amazed that we can build things like computers and TVs and that we're such limited beings that we have this knowledge to do all of these things now. And actually, they consider us a threat to a certain degree. One of the things you have to remember that jinn are plasma beings. They're contained by magnetic fields. This is what I'm assuming from what I'm hearing. So they're very susceptible to electromagnetic pulses. One of the reasons is that they're afraid that the human race is going to develop some type of technology which is going to affect them where they are and destroy them. So this is why, for example, they're keeping an eye on us. There are many people in the Middle East and even in this country who do believe that we're being spied upon um, from a distance and watched for many, many centuries, watching us develop and keeping an eye on us so we don't get out of hand. Well, that brings up uh, you know, a follow-up question that I had. 
uh, concerning a very tantalizing uh, bit of information that you relayed uh, in that, that there seems to be, according to rumor, a, a concerted effort by the Western military, I guess, intelligence powers uh, to capture a gin. Uh, can you shed any more light on that particular assertion? Or Oh, yeah, because, you know, when I was over in the Middle East, and not only did I hear it at the dinner table from a member of the royal family, when I was in Oman and Finn in the, Had- in the Hadjar Mountains, in the village I encountered uh, an, a person who spoke really good English. He was a teacher, but he lived in Oman. He was educated in the United States, and he liked to go hiking in the Hadjar Mountains, which is very beautiful, by the way. And um, he said one day he was hiking in a certain area, and he came across, he saw a a black portal open up, and he saw a Janaya with her child. A Janaya is a female jinn. And according to to the beliefs there, when a Janaya is with its child, it's very protective. He saw the Janaya, and her eyes looked at him like, you know, I'm going to kill you if you if you even make a move. And he became very terrified, and he ran. Now, as he's trying to get away, he's running over the hill, he says, Jeeps came over and helicopters came over. And he said they picked him up and it was military men. He said they were Saudis. He said they were um, Americans. He said they were Europeans. They brought him to what he said an op- a base of operations in, 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 a, in the Hajar Mountains. And they took him into a room and they debriefed him exactly what he saw, where he saw it. And he said he was more afraid of these individuals who were humans than he was of the Janiyah that he saw. He wouldn't tell me much more information after that because he was afraid they were going to come and get him if he revealed too much information. But this is, once again, this is operation I'm hearing about governments of the world trying to capture a jinn. Now, over in Pine Bush, New York, um, back in the 90s, there was a lot of UFO sightings, a lot of strange creatures appearing and also. Now, one day and one evening, it happened on a number of occasions, the military came in, blocked off an entire area, knocked on the doors of people and told them to stay inside their homes. Do not come out. People were looking out and seeing helicopters coming down, people, all kinds of military vehicles coming up, and something was going on. They told them it was just a training exercise. Now, with all of that activity taking place there in the Hudson Valley, my contacts told me that this is before I went to Saudi Arabia, that there was a dimensional being transversing the dimensions in a portal in the Pine Bush area, and there was a special unit in the military that was specially trained to capture it and take its technology. So that's from three different sources that I've heard it in my own investigations. I'll tell you what, we'll pursue those investigations in far more detail as we explore the legends and the possible reality of the vengeful jinn with Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip Imbrogno. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in The Paracast. Have you been sitting on a few great domain name ideas but haven't locked them in for yourself? Good. Now you can buy them through the number one domain name registrar, Namecheap.com, as voted by the top tech blog Lifehacker. Just like the name says, you can buy domains cheap, as low as $2.99. And every new domain comes with WhoisGuard, our special privacy service, free for the first year. Now that you know, it's time to grab those domain names before someone else does. Namecheap.com. Go now. Namecheap.com. Fate Magazine provides true reports of the strange and unknown. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, life after death, and much, much more. To receive your free issue of Fate Magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. Are you wondering about your retirement portfolio? 
Are you confident that the financial advisor is experienced enough to combat climbing interest rates, taxes, and inflation? Stop guessing and go to the expert, Robert Chapman of the International Forecaster. When you subscribe to the International Forecaster, you get Robert Chapman's 45 years of experience and concise investment recommendations. Who needs sugar-coated excuses when you can get the cold hard facts and proven investment leads you can't get anywhere else? For a free introductory copy to Robert Chapman's International Forecaster, subscribe now at the internationalforecaster.com or call 877-479-8178. Experience the difference. When you subscribe, you can email Robert Chapman directly to obtain investment advice tailored just for you. Don't wait another minute. Subscribe today at the internationalforecaster.com or call 877-479-8178. That's 877-479-8178. Alex has told you that the Mideast uprisings over food prices and shortages caused by fuel costs are spreading worldwide. We're seeing the impact right here in the United States. Ethanol that was supposed to reduce petroleum use and fuel prices hit a 30-month high in February, and pump prices are expected to reach $5 a gallon. Because of shipping costs, food is being priced out of the reach of millions of Americans with an expected 35% jump in the next 60 days. Move quickly while you can still afford it, and eFoods Direct will pay your shipping costs for you. For the best-tasting, long-term storable food, you pay nothing for shipping and can put every dollar into food at today's prices. eFoods Direct, food so delicious you can serve it tonight or save it for the future. Take advantage of free shipping by calling 800-409-5633. On the web, eFoodsDirect.com slash Alex, 800-409-5633 or eFoodsDirect.com slash Alex. Never buy home canning jar lids again. No kidding. When you buy Tadler reusable canning lids once, you'll never buy canning lids ever again. Safely store emergency preparedness foods for years. Traditional metal lids are single-use throwaways containing BPA. But Tadler reusable canning lids are guaranteed to last a lifetime when used as designed for home canning. Tadler lids are made with a USDA and FDA-approved food-grade plastic, safe for direct food contact, and contain no BPA. Tadler lids are dishwasher safe, usable with standard pressure or water bath canning, eliminate food spoilage from acid corrosion, fit standard mason jars are indefinitely reusable and are proudly made in the usa place orders at reusablecanninglids.com or call 1-877-747-2793 877-747-2793 call 877-747-2793 or go to reusablecanninglids.com that's reusablecanninglids.com for tadler reusable canning lids the original since 1976 the GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you want to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out on iTunes. As we continue, we're well into our second hour of the show with Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip Ambrogno. We're exploring the vengeful jinn, the legends of the genies, supernatural beings from possibly a paramount dimension. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast, and we have co-host Chris O'Brien who's going to pick up on the questioning. Chris? One of the things that um, kind of comes through fairly, uh, fairly loudly here is this whole idea of the subterranean element with the gin and the fact that uh, it does appear that they tend to prefer, um, according to the tradition, subterranean spaces, caves, um, underground tunnel systems, that sort of thing. I know, Phil, you were involved in, in digging into some, uh, you know, <laughs> pardon the pun, into some uh, pretty interesting cavern systems in the Pine Bush area that you were just talking about in the Hudson R- uh, River Valley area. And uh, you did relate, you know, your experience spelunking into one of the largest caves, I think, on the planet. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. What is the connection between this subterranean element that you find in, in fairy lore, uh, in other traditional types of uh, lore that has to do with caves. Uh, what is the connection there, do you think? Well, that's one for Rosemary. She's more versed than that. 
There are a number of connections, uh, Chris. There's a very strong association between gin and fairies. And in fact, uh, I think that this is one of their favorite forms that they've adopted, uh, especially in the past, because the fairies have a similar story. They were the original inhabitants of this earth and they lost out to human beings. Not quite in the same way, but the same result. They lost out, they lost their place, and they retreated to another place to live. And for fairies, this was um, another dimension that was accessed underground. There were these openings in tree roots and in mounds that led across this uh, what seemed to be a magical threshold to the parallel dimension where fairies lived all underground. Uh, and time passed differently, spaces opened up uh, into small spaces would open up into huge ways, almost like the, the TARDIS in Doctor Who. You know, you go into the police uh, box and it opens up into a huge thing. And we found in uh, a lot of our investigations that these portal areas that are terrifically haunted and with gin, we believe, um, often have caves, major sources of underground water, tunnels, uh, like old abandoned mine shafts, uh, and in lore, these underground passageways have long been associated with transit points between the spirit realms and our realms, that spirits have a way of traveling through them. And then, of course, we have the reptilian association. Reptilians, which are lumped in with extraterrestrials a lot, may not really be ETs, but ultra-terrestrials, beings from another dimension. And they're said to live underground, too, of course, like snakes would, because snakes have holes in the ground. And the reptilians uh, would be a favored form of the jinn. In Middle, e Middle Eastern lore, snakes are one of their dominant shape-shifted forms. And so we have that uh, connection there, sort of linking the... Uh, one kind of ultra or extraterrestrial to the jinn, uh, to a shape-shifted form, to an underground um, abode that would be um, considered to be like a parallel dimension to ours. You know, Magonia, you know, borrowing the, uh, the title of Jacques Vallée's uh, Passport to Magonia, which is, a, I think, a French version of that other world or netherworld um, that has access points underground. I, I, I must add that one of the uh, largest, I think it is actually the largest cavern system in Colorado, overlooks one of the most active portal areas that I personally investigated. So I've always been very intrigued by this subterranean connection. And you even find it in Bigfoot, uh, you know, places where Bigfoot tend to be reported repeatedly also tend to feature subterranean cavern systems. Um, one of the things that I was struck by uh, your book, and I didn't know this when I, uh, prior to reading it, is that there, in the Islamic tradition and in the traditional knowledge related to the jinn in the Middle East, there are certain elements and certain um, tools that tend to somehow exert control over these entities and one of those is iron and i found that to be very uh very interesting uh scientifically i think that there may be something to do with iron and magnetic fields and i think phil you might want to want to address this but what is it about iron and and the ability to somehow um, repel gin or control them with iron iron special iron iron that's made from magnetite no less Ah, and um, yes, I mean, gin were encased in brass bottles with an iron magnetic mesh around it, keeping the gin neutralized. You know, um, when there are fishermen in the Middle East, uh, when they put their nets in um, the Arabian Sea or where they, wherever they are, and they pull up an old bottle, they throw it right back in because they're afraid it might hold a very nasty gin who was imprisoned. So we see this, um, for example, in paranormal phenomena, for example, shadow people sightings, and Rosemary will probably say a little more about this, is that we found that when people turn on their televisions, they turn on all their lights, and they turn on everything, it, the paranormal phenomena seems to die down, especially the shadow people. And uh, you have to remember, when you're using all these electrical things like TVs and stuff, you're generating magnetic fields. 
And it could be that you're repelling these dimensional beings from entering into your reality there. So we go back once again to the legends. And the legends and the mythology of the jinn say they be, can be contained and controlled by iron, magnetic iron. And today we see that in our modern technology that when we generate magnetic fields in the home that is experiencing paranormal phenomena, and especially shadow people, the phenomena dies down or disappears. Until to, so course, so like turning on phenomena. lights or something, just, just the very act of and turning And TVs on. and radios and so on. Right. How many times we've come across this and heard this, and of course over the years you don't put you know two and two together until you once again take the jinn into consideration and put them into the equation of the paranormal. Right. Another another thing uh, that I've noticed in it's kind of a cross correlation between you know a, a whole plethora of, of different types of phenomenal events uh, that have been reported down through the ages. One of the things that tends to be, I think, consistent and is a correlation, obviously, is the shape-shifting aspect, but also the plasma aspect. I think that is a very important uh, possible connection point between, let's say, the UFO phenomenon, for instance, some sort of spectral or ghost-type phenomena, and, and the gin. Now, let's look at this whole idea of plasma and uh, get into it a little bit deeper in, in terms of how you can actually use a, a plasma to transmute, as you as you gave the example, glass into gold. How can something that has smokeless fire uh, or plasma? How is it able to manipulate matter to such a, a drastic degree? I mean, I wish I knew the answer to that. Phil, it, before it, we do the answer, we got to do the break. Phil Imbrogno and Rosemary Ellen Guiley. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then, a coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack! Attack! Of the Rockwell. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans the galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack, Attack of the Rockoids is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R O C K O I D S.com. Attack, Attack. Of the Rock a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. Hi, this is Alex Jones. Did you know that the global elite are now storing non-hybrid seeds in secret storage vaults near the Arctic Circle? Did you know that in a real meltdown, non-hybrid seeds can become more valuable than silver or gold? It's true, seeds have outperformed even gold and silver before in this country, and it's possible that it could even happen again. So our friends at Solutions from Science have put together the perfect mix of non-hybrid seeds. They call it a survival seed bank. And it can produce an endless supply of nutrient-dense food for you and your family. And here's the best part. These seeds have not been genetically modified in any way. And you actually get enough seeds to plant a full acre crisis garden. So visit them today at survivalseedbank.com. That's survivalseedbank.com. Or give them a call at 877-327-0365. That's 877-327-0365. Remember, in a real crisis... Non-hybrid seeds are the ultimate barter item. This is Alex Jones for SurvivalSeedBank.com. This special announcement is brought to you by Renaissance Charge. Have you ever wondered if you could make your car run on 100% electric power for free? It is now possible. How about a simple device that is both a super efficient motor and a free energy generator at the same time? What if this could also be used to restore useless batteries and save you lots of money? Because our customers asked for it, we have organized a Renaissance Charge Conference Workshop on July 29th to July 31st at the beautiful Coeur d'Alene Resort in Idaho. Not only will you see these fascinating energizers, but you will be able to build some alongside genius inventor John Bedini. Participate in this truly historic event featuring our cutting-edge alternative energy Tesla technology. Register early for the best seats and advanced workshop by visiting rcharge.com. That's r-charge.com for details. 
or call 208-772-4514. That's 208-772-4514. Did you know that drinking pure, high alkaline water is one of the most important factors in maintaining high energy and vibrant health? Most experts agree that the water you drink should be at a pH level of 8 or higher. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops, available only at AlkaVision.com, combine a unique formula of only the most alkaline minerals. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops alkalize your water, ridding the body of harmful toxins, and helps you regain health and energy. Alkalizing your water by simply adding 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops helps Helps the body rid itself of acidic waste, increases oxygen content, and raises the pH of your body to healthy levels. And bacteria and viruses cannot survive in an alkaline high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops for only $29.95 at AlkaVision.com. That's A-L-K-A-Vision.com. Or call 269-409-1776. 269-409-1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com today. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Hi, my name is Richard Dolan. You're listening to the Paracast. We're back with Phil Imbrogno, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast where, Phil, you're saying you're not able to really answer the question that Chris posed. Well, for, I, I could give you some, you know, in, in, you know, spiritual, etherical, whatever you want to answer, but, you know, that doesn't make sense. But the only thing I can tell you is that a plasma can actually interconnect with matter. So unlike human beings that we can't go down and touch individual atoms, uh, a plasma contained by a magnetic field can spindle itself out to actually project part of itself into the very core of the elementary particles that make up matter and rearrange them. And now this may sound like magic, but it's not. But once again, gin seem to have this ability. But it's something they're not born with. It's something they have the ability to do, but they have to learn how to do it. For example, in order to make gold from lead, let's say, you know, just an example out of the blue, they have to know the exact arrangement of quarks and other elementary particles that make up you know, an, a, a nucleus of gold to make the gold. They have to have this knowledge. And it seems from what I found out is that from a very early age, like humans, gin go to like a, a, a training session, school, so to speak, and they advance as far as they want. And if they keep on learning all their life, they become more powerful, able to do more amazing things. If they stop learning at a certain age, they can do very little. This is why some jinn are more powerful than others. Some of them are more formidable than others. So And older. And older, too. But the older they get, we imagine that the more knowledge they obtain. But that's not always the case in human beings. Uh, yes, as you get older, you acquire more knowledge. But with jinn... You know, they're capable of doing much more, and uh, they're not as limited. But you see, we also have an amazing ability to take matter and manipulate it by building things like computers, TVs, automobiles, aircraft. You see, the jinn look at this and our ability, and, and from what I hear and understand, they find it pretty amazing that human beings have come this far to do this. And, of course, they are a much older race, and human beings are a much younger race. So they're afraid, and one of the fears they have is that one day human beings will evolve more powerful than they are and completely wipe them out, knock them out of, out of the game, so to speak. And, and that would probably be due to you know accessing and, and being able to utilize technology, I would think. That yes, would probably be exactly, something that they would yeah. be very fearful of. Here's another uh, interesting thing that you bring up in your book. And, and towards the end of the book, you, you talk about portal areas and how they may be a really important sort of litmus test to, uh, to look at as, an, as investigators um, to see if there's potential gin activity there. And you bring up the uh, the infamous Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, you bring up the San Luis Valley, 
And you also uh, talk about the farm, which you don't actually identify where it is or particulars about its actual location. But uh, Rosemary, evidently for the last couple of years, you've been pretty uh, zeroed in on a particular location-specific area in a rural, uh, a rural setting that has just a bewildering array of paranormal phenomena. My question is, is that bewildering array of phenomena a clue for you to potentially identify uh, gin activity? Yes, absolutely. They seem to be um, most noticeable in these portal areas. Phil and I have been doing uh, substantial research to document the characteristics of portal areas. This case uh, that I call the farm has been ongoing now for uh, a little over a couple of years, and uh, we give it a full chapter in our next book called Multidimensional Portals, which will be out in December, um, and we introduce it in The Vengeful Gin. It's in an area that I call the Appalachian Doorway, which which actually starts in the Alleghenies in southwestern Pennsylvania, goes down through West Virginia in the Ohio Valley and spills into Ohio, and uh, even on down into the Brown Mountains of uh, North Carolina. That whole area down there is very active with what I call broad-spectrum paranormal phenomena, that is everything. Mysterious lights, entity contact, UFOs, mysterious creatures, ghosts and poltergeist activity. And I think that it is one of the gin strongholds in America. Uh, and I think that's the case in portal areas around the world. They could exist where there are crossroads or nexus points at ley lines, for example, or when we have the right geophysical configuration uh, with the negative magnetic anomalies and uh, the underground uh, things that we were talking about, the tunnels and the caves and underground water. Jinn seem to like these areas, and there may be something about the natural energy and magnetic energy or absence of it that uh, enables them to pass between worlds with more ease. That seems to be the case with other paranormal entity manifestations as well. Oh, and Bigfoot sightings are, are big in this area too. So it, it's, it's like a doorway where a lot of things can come and go. And for Jin, it seems to be easy for them to have this territorial anchor. Uh, this seems to be a characteristic of the Jin in these cases. There's a territorial turf-mindedness that manifests when the entity wishes to communicate. I'm older than you are. I've been here a long time. I was here first. This is my place. You're the squatters, and you're not welcome. That message is communicated over and over again in these cases that we've looked into. Every time you mention that, that they once had dominion over the earth, and now we control it more or less, in some half hard fashion, unfortunately. Are they not able to basically take control again? Not enough numbers of them? What? Well, only a faction of them uh, are interested in being aggressive toward human beings. And uh, as Phil mentioned earlier, you know, the jinn come in all stripes the good, the bad, and the ugly, just like human beings. So in some cases, uh, we may be dealing with either these psychotic jinn or these renegade jinn, uh, the terrorist faction of them. It may also have to do with uh, their ability to manifest for any length of time in our dimension, and that's going to vary uh, jinn, literally jinn by uh, individual jinn in terms of their power. Um, we've noticed in these these portal area cases where the activity sort of rolls in a roller coaster. It'll crescendo up to a point and then it drops down again. It's like something having to recharge its battery. So it, it indicates that whatever is present can't act out in uh, intense extreme ways all the time. It seems to have to regroup. So there's probably a whole lot of factors involved that um, are, are dictating the ability of the jinn to make inroads. One of them 
that I think um, they're pursuing quite actively is in this phenomenon called shadow people. I think these dark silhouettes who come and visit people in their bedrooms at night looking like tall men wearing coats and hats, they're, they're an unknown entity um, for the most part, but I think that they're gin, and I think that they are coming to try and get into our heads or into us, our consciousness, while we're most vulnerable sleeping, and get information from us. It could be biological, neurological, chemical, genetic, even our thought processes. They want information from us that's going to help them uh, become better able to live here. Well, so there's something up. here that doesn't let them live here is what you're saying. And I want to ask more about that because I've become ever, ever curious about that. Maybe we'll even ask questions about Jin society. Do they have presidents? Do they have emperors, empresses, queens, whatever? More stuff like that. The Vengeful Jin is the book. The author is Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip M. Brogno. I'm Gene Steinberg. Your co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. For centuries, silver has been used as a powerful natural antibiotic. And as a listener to this station, you probably already know the benefits of using colloidal silver. With so many websites to choose from, finding a reputable patriotic company with great products at affordable prices can be a difficult task. Introducing UtopiaSilver.com. UtopiaSilver.com carries the best, most effective, and most affordable colloidal silver and colloidal gold products in the industry. UtopiaSilver.com also carries products to fit your lifestyle, including weight loss, immune system defense, cleanses, herbs, joint and bone care, and much more. First-time customers using promo code GCN50 will receive 50% off all colloidal products. Visit us today at Utopia Silver. That's U-T-O-P-I-A Silver, utopiasilver.com, or call 888-213-4338. That's 888-213-4338, utopiasilver.com, taking back America's health care one American at a time. Go solar for cheap. Want to use solar power but the price is too high? Now you can build your own solar panels for less than $200 at 123cheapsolar.com. Don't laugh. We've sold over 45,000 solar do-it-yourself kits. Watch the step-by-step videos that even non-handyman types can use. We offer a 60-day money-back guarantee. Go to 123cheapsolar.com or call 800-713-0486. 800-713-0486. Reduce your foreign oil dependency when you go green with 123cheapsolar.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. If you owe money to the IRS, you can't make the problem go away by yourself. But with the help of Dan Pilla, you can get your problem solved once and for all. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. For 30 years, I've helped thousands of people solve their tax debt problem, and I can help you solve yours, too. We take a very simple but proven three-step approach to solving your problem. First, we stabilize IRS collection actions so you don't have to worry about the IRS seizing your bank account or paycheck. Next, we build a comprehensive plan to get your tax debt reduced to the fullest extent possible, sometimes even completely eliminated. 
And finally, we work with you every step of the way to get your problem solved once and for all. Call us for a free consultation. Call 1-800-346-6829. We'll work together to get your problem solved guaranteed. Dan Pilla has been protecting taxpayers from the IRS for three decades, and he can help you too. Call us today at 800-346-6829. That's 800-34-NO-TAX. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. You're in the Paracast. You never know what's going to happen next. A little bit later, we're going to ask your questions, listeners. Chris has been assembling the ones posted in our forums at forum.paracast.com. Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. So, Rosemary, that's the kind of question here. What kind of society do the jinn have? Do they have separate tribes, nations, etc.? Do they have some kind of governing body? Policemen to protect against renegades from pulling mischief. Well, they, they do have organizations, and actually I'm going to pass that back to Phil because he became very well acquainted with that when he was doing his Middle Eastern travels. Well, the jinn, um, you see, they have, they have clans. They have a clan leader. The clan leader is responsible for all the families that belong to the clan. If a, if a jinn in a family gets out of hand, the clan leader is responsible. He has to answer to a jinn king. Now, jinn have courts. They're made up of clan leaders. And if someone gets out of hand, breaks the jinn law, they have to go in front of the clan's courts and sentences passed upon them in whatever way. But there are renegade jinn. For example, in cases where a jinn, you see, the jinn. They, one of the reasons why some of them like to infiltrate into a world because they want to experience physical pleasures again. And sometimes a jinn may get out of hand and come into our world and be doing things that he's not supposed to be doing. He's not a renegade. He's not one of these outcasts who are psychotic that were, that were exiled from, from the jinn community. He's someone who's just curious, but he's breaking the jinn law, and that's not, not to interact with human beings normally. And um, the jinn will not give his Prime name. Prime directive because, then, right? Yes, yeah, kind of. Like <laughs> the jinn will not give his name. It will try to hide who it is because if he find out its name and they find out he's a jinn, you could go and, and try to contact the clan leader to have him punished. So he won't tell you his name and what clan he belongs to. He'll try to put on this facade about who he is. He could be an extraterrestrial. He could be an angel. He could be a demon or whatever. You know, he could be a childhood fantasy character or whatever. But they do answer to, to, to clan leaders. But there is the terrorists of the jinn that we focus in on the vengeful jinn. They were characterized as calling themselves the red jinn. Now, these are people who do not follow any clans. They're out there. They've been exiled from clans. They broke apart. They do not follow any jinn kings or any rules. They are like terrorists. They only follow iblis. They worship Iblis. They look at Iblis as sort of like a, a liberator, a freedom fighter who's trying to establish them back into the world where they belong to. And they, they look at it this way. Suppose you, you have this beautiful house and beautiful property, and then someone of a higher authority, let's say the government, comes in one day and says, you're out of your house and I'm putting somebody else in there and you're going to live in a smaller place down the road. I mean, you would look back at that house and say, boy, I work so hard. That's my house, and I want it back. You see, this is the mentality as, as, as some, some of these jinn think. They believe they in want, eminent domain, then. They, they believe that it's their, it, it belongs to them. It was originally theirs, and that they want it back. And, uh, but, you see, there seems to be a higher authority, whether you want to call them, you know, ascended beings or whatever you angels or higher extraterrestrials or higher dimensional beings whatever you want to call them they seem to be afraid this is who they have to answer to so one of the things in islamic history is that the jinn infiltrate into our world trying to get human beings to destroy themselves so they could be held unaccountable for the destruction of the human race and once the human race is gone they can move back in Chris, we've been assembling some questions here from 
our audience at forum.theparacast.com. You have those up? I do. Okay, let's start asking your questions, listeners. Now, here's the way it works. When we know in advance, and sometimes we don't know, we book a guest at the last minute. When we know far enough in advance that we're going to be recording a segment with a guest or two guests or more, we will try to post something in the question bank, which is at forum.theparacast.com. That's where you can ask questions of guests, and we ask them as Chris is going to do right now. Okay, this one comes from RJ Hark 0 I think he joined last month, actually, to the forum. And he has a very interesting uh, question that may spark, uh, I think, uh, an interesting answer. Have the researchers made a connection between the smokeless fire of the jinn and the burning bush episode in Exodus 3, I think it was chapter 3, verse 1, line 21, the bush that is not consumed by fire? He f- goes on and, and puts his own thinking into it and says, I think that the similarity may underscore more widespread folkloric or mythological uh, trope in the Near Eastern religions. There are many indications of volcanic deities being worshipped in ancient northern Arabia and southern Palestine. They may have looked into this already, but I thought it would be worth mentioning. So could the jinn have been responsible in tricking Moses uh, with a burning bush? It sounds kind of plausible, I guess. Well, we do address that. And um, the pillar of fire right. and the burning bush, and uh, it seems that the jinn have interacted with the human race throughout time in many different ways. It's very possible that some of these ancient gods that were thought to exist a long time ago in Babylon and and uh, Samaria and so on, and some of the Mesopotamia and some of the ancient areas, they could have been jinn. Okay, you do address that in the book, and that's uh, an interesting question. I think uh, someone is out there thinking on the uh, the forums. Here's another one. There is a belief that the incorrect practice or overpractice of various styles of Qigong, or, you know, it's a form of yoga, can induce what has been called, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, uh, Zuho Rumo, or Kijong, uh, um, what is the word? Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of... I am not, not going to Chinese. get you out of this jam, Chris, because I do it <laughs> worse than you would. <laughs> okay, there is a belief that the incorrect practice of Qigong can induce what has been called Qigong disease, which is a form of induced psychosis. And I don't know where Alzo, our questioner, came up with this particular fact, but he said it is rumored to be caused by jinn attaching themselves to the chi created by the inexperienced practitioner, in effect possessing the individual. So in other words, I think the question is, if you are an inexperienced practitioner of a, a form of energy manipulation like Qigong, do, could that potentially open you up for possession of a jinn? can possess people, and uh, they do so, like uh, Phil mentioned, to uh, experience physical pleasure. Uh, And I think that there are various ways the jinn can attach. Uh, I'd hesitate to put out an alarm that doing, um, you know, energy and meditational practices could lead to, to that. I think there would have to be something else involved for the jinn to latch on. Phil, maybe you have some other thoughts on that. Well, you know, I know for sure that um, there are certain um, meditation techniques used in the Middle East that were thought to attract jinn. And I mean, if you're if you're manipulating energy on a psychic level, it may be like a spotlight or shooting up a flare to attract the jinn to come to you. Um, now, the jinn do possess people. But they don't enter the body. They attach through the nervous, central nervous system. They're, they're afraid of being trapped inside the body. So they can experience everything that the body and the person experiences, but they can be separated from it. And um, this is how they experience um, physical pleasure in our world. But, yes, also, by the way, they can get into the body and cause physical illness by breaking down the magnetic field in your body and the electrical system in your body, knocking down your immune system, causing a number of diseases from being um, more susceptible to viruses to cancer. I mean... This is um, this is the danger of you know jinn possession, and in the Middle East, by the way, when a jinn 
possesses somebody, they can't exercise it. The cleric or the holy man or the expert comes over, the exorcist comes over and deals with the jinn. How long are you going to be in that body? How long will you stay? And the jinn will say, I'll be here two weeks and then I'll leave. I just want to experience a lot of different things. And they say, okay, after two weeks you must leave the body. Okay. If he doesn't leave, the next step is they take sticks and they start beating the body and causing physical pain because the jinn can feel it and the jinn will leave. So, you know, this opens up a whole, you know, can no can of worms as to as to how the jinn can um, um, uh, really affect human beings. A reminder, if you have a question or a comment about the Paracast, write us, news at theparacast.com. Once again, that is news at theparacast.com. We read each and every letter we get, guaranteed. We don't know how we're being affected by all this, but our sponsors will be affected if we don't give them a chance. We have Phil Ambrogno, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you own an Apple iPhone and love to listen to your favorite programs on GCN, I've got good news for you. I'm proud to announce that GCN has a brand new iPhone app available for our dedicated listeners at GCNlive.com. Listen to your favorite hard-hitting GCN programs live or on demand right on your iPhone. And the best part? The GCN iPhone app can be yours absolutely free. Download the iPhone app today by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. Hi, this this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. This is our final hour of dealing with the subject of vengeful gin. And we're asking your questions of Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Phil Brockno. Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Chris, you have some more questions from the forums. I do. Uh, before I go on to uh, forum questions, though, I, I do want to um, kind of dive in a little bit deeper about this connection between humans and gin and whether these types of uh, connections can be induced by humans. There's a very interesting section in your book where you talk about um, Alistair Crowley and you talk about H.P. Lovecraft and and other individuals that that may have had some sort of inside knowledge that allows them to be in a position to inadvertently or by design uh, establish connection with Jen. And one interesting instance that you uh, you note in the book uh, occurred in December 1909 when uh, Alistair Crowley and Victor Newberg, his assistant, were in Algeria and they went out into the desert to to conduct rituals for the purpose of uh, accessing high level ethers, I guess, for the lack of a better term, in what was called in the 19th call of Enochian magic. Now, a lot of our skeptics, of course, are going to be rolling their eyes about this point, but uh, having a a bit of a knowledge about ritual magic, and I know, uh, of course, Rosemary has uh, quite an extensive knowledge in this area. What do you think of the whole idea of actually manifesting uh, willfully uh, the gin, and would you comment on this uh, very peculiar episode that Crowley and uh, Newberg supposedly, allegedly went through, and now you know outside of Algeria? I think it is indeed possible to uh, to conjure up the gin, and there are all sorts of magical procedures for this uh, in the Eastern world, uh, and some of these magical uh, incantations and uh, uh, methodologies that infiltrated into the Western uh, magical system uh, can do the same. And these entities are not always called jinn, but they may be one and the same. And um, I couldn't help but notice uh, a lot of 
similarities to um, Lovecraft's work, uh, the old ones. Uh, I think that Lovecraft probably had some knowledge of the jinn, which he didn't formally uh, acknowledge, uh, that became embedded in his uh, what he said was a fictional work, the Necronomicon, but may in fact have uh, drawn on something uh, more real than that. Now, the the case with Aleister Crowley, um, he was in contact with very high level and very powerful entities, uh, which were called demons. But the term demon really doesn't necessarily mean a satanic agency bent on destroying the human soul. Uh, demons refer to a wide variety of, of entities that have the capability of uh, interacting and interfering with people. And that one episode in the desert, Corin, where they uh, conjured up this demon Corazon, the demon of the abyss, a very powerful entity, Crowley went into a trance and his assistant, Victor Newberg, was left inside the uh, magic circle, uh, the protection of the magic circle, the entity was conjured into the magic triangle. And in magic, this is a system set up to protect the uh, practitioner. The entity is sort of bound into this circle and can't, uh, or the triangle, and can't move into the circle. But um, it managed through shape-shifting and through um, invective uh, and, and anger to breach the magic circle and attack uh, Newberg. And the story is told that the two of them, the entity and Newberg, actually physically wrestled. And uh, Newberg was physically injured from this while uh, Alistair was in, in this trance um, situation. And eventually, uh, Victor quelled the entity and, and sent it back out. Um, it was said afterwards uh, that uh, Aleister Crowley was forever affected by this mentally, that the, the state of consciousness that he had to go into in order to uh, make contact with Corinzon had sort of rendered him uh, at least partially insane uh, for the rest of his life. And the various interpretations were put on this that um, maybe uh, it was a projection and not an actual entity. Um, you have to allow for the fact that Alistair Crowley was an embellisher, you know, and he did seem to have genuine magic, magical talent. Uh, and uh, But yet he he liked to be over the top too and uh, but even if you take away that even if you take away the um the embroidery that's probably uh, in this story you're still left with an encounter with this very powerful entity which um bears a lot of resemblance to jinn yeah and i think newberg uh, was you know permanently affected by this i think didn't he commit suicide if i remember correctly or I think he he met some uh, pretty nasty ending, if I remember correctly. It's been a while since I've visited that particular story. But uh, it seems to me that uh, an encounter of that sort would leave a lasting impression. And so it, it, wouldn't, uh, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if this could be, uh, you know, part of why Crowley became so, uh, you know, adamant about, you know, breaking the back of the Victorian age, basically. Um, it, this kind of leads us into another question, and, and that is uh, close encounter cases, such as the Betty and Barney case. Uh, of course, Betty and Barney Hill uh, in the early 60s, uh, one of the, I guess, sort of linchpin abduction uh, scenarios, one of the first uh, that we have on record that's um, fairly well documented. Blowfish wants to know if uh, if there is some sort of connection between the abduction phenomenon uh, as it manifests in the modern day um, and the gin. And we have kind of basically touched on this, but looking at it from a pure uh, field investigator point of view, do you think there are a, a percentage of cases uh, that have been lumped into the abduction scenario that are actually uh, some sort of contact with, with, with gin? Well, I think there are because uh, from the very early days of my investigation into the UFO phenomena, especially the abduction cases, you see that there are different types of abductions and contact that, make, that is taking place. 
And, you know, I'm not saying jinn are responsible for all the UFO abductions, but they may be responsible for a certain number. For example, you have abductions that seem to be extraterrestrial in nature. And, of course, we don't know if they are or not for sure. But you also have these abductions that seem to be dimensional in nature, where the beings are almost reptilian in shape. They seem to change shape. They seem to abduct people by taking them through portals into, and then they're in a room and so on. So all the abduction cases are not typical physical uh, Betty Hill sort of abductions. And by the way, Betty Hill I knew very well. Her very early abductions, when I first heard the original tapes that were played to me by John Fuller of the hypnotic session of Barney and Betty Hill, I mean, I was convinced right there in the 80s that, you know, they were alien abductions. But later on, you know, it was conversations that I had with Betty on the phone. Her contacts and, and her ongoing experiences seemed to be more metaphysical or more dimensional in nature rather than physical extraterrestrials. It's hard really to place a finger on it because um, – her ideas and her contacts seem to be more dimensional in nature as time went on. And you see this with a lot of people who've experienced abductions. After a while, their stories seem to be more like um, um, ghost stories or, or encounters with demonic entities and, and hauntings rather than visitors from another star system. So I imagine that a certain percentage of abductions are from dimensional beings, ultra-terrestrials, and of course, ultra-terrestrials are jinn. That's, that's what the folklore, the legendary name for them is. The book is called The Vengeful Jinn. With us this evening, the authors, Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip M. Brogno, and we're tying a whole bunch of things together. The Jinn, UFO abductions, UFOs in general. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in The Paracast. <laughs> You expect professional service from your doctor, your accountant, and even the girl who takes your morning coffee order. Why not from your domain registrar, too? Namecheap.com provides stellar service with no sneaky upselling. We offer more features and security options for your website than there are ways to order a latte. And new domains come with WhoisGuard to protect your personal info. At Namecheap.com, you can get your domain for as low as $2.99. Now is a great time to get to know Namecheap.com. For 58 years, fate has provided true reports of the strange and unknown. Fate brings you the latest in all aspects of the paranormal, like angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, and much, much more. To receive your complimentary fate magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. On the average, Americans work between 45 to 50 years hoping to build up enough wealth to retire and live out their golden years. Unfortunately, with taxation, the rising cost of food, energy, housing, and medical, many retirees are forced to live below the poverty line. Is this a flaw free enterprise, or is our monetary unit we call the Federal Reserve Note forcing us into perpetual debt, ensuring inflation and higher taxes? These questions and more can be answered by reading G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Congressman Ron Paul states it's what every American needs to know about central bank power. A gripping adventure into the secret world of international banking cartel. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I will give a silver dollar from the early 1900s to anyone who purchases this book. Call 1-800-686-2237 and order a copy today. It's critical that the public be made aware of the system. Call and order your copy today at 1-800-686-2237. That's 1-800-686-2237. This message starts with a great offer from Big Berkey Water Filters because we don't want you drinking dangerous water one minute longer. Right now, purchase any filter system from BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com to get your choice of two Berkey Sport Bottles, a KDF shower filter, a set of fluoride filters, or our new Cyclass spigot absolutely free. Why do this? Because over 60% of municipal water is fluoridated, and at less than two cents per gallon, Berkey Water Filters purify both treated and untreated water, removing dangerous chlorine, fluoride, and other contaminants. 
Big Berkey water filters are powerful enough to purify stagnant pond water, so they're perfect for rainwater collection systems and emergency preparedness. Remember, Big Berkey includes free shipping on every order over $50. And GCN listeners get 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit B-I-G-B-E-R-K-E-Y waterfilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY. That's Big Berkey waterfilters.com or call today 1-877-99-BERKEY. The largest part of gaining radiant health is detoxification. You can drink ionized water, cleanse your intestines, eat a perfect diet, and even take lots of quality supplements and in many instances only make minimal progress. What is the key to detoxifying your body of mercury, heavy metals, chemicals, and drugs? It is glutathione. Glutathione is the master antioxidant used to detoxify your entire body. It stops free radicals, keeps cells young, and reduces inflammation. One World Whey protein powder may be able to raise your glutathione production by 64% or more. One World Whey is more effective than any other whey protein powder on the market because it is unheated and from grass-fed cows. All other, quote, cold-processed whey protein powders have been heated and damaged by 15% or more. One World Whey comes in three delicious flavors. Call 888-988-3325. That's 888-988. 988-3325 or visit oneworldway.com that's oneworld w-h-e-y.com the gcn radio network providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio g c n great talk radio starts here we want to hear from you if you have a comment or question about the paracast send it to news at theparacast.com That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Get in on all the action at forum.theparacast.com. We're back with Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Phil Imbrogno. The book is The Vengeful Gin. And I had a question before we go on. Chris O'Brien asks some more responses from our forums, and that is this. Okay, we talk about they, the people, the jinn, the creatures coming here. What about going there? Can we go there? I think we probably do sometimes. I think we (laughs) fall through the window in in the opposite direction as well. Uh, There are some precedences for this in the fairy lore where people stumble through that doorway in the the fairy wrath or how, as it was called, the mound uh, leading into the underworld and uh, had incredible experiences. Now, in fairy lore, if you stumbled into fairyland, the odds were very slim that you would come out. The fairies would hold you captive there. It's sort of like a one-way doorway. We can speculate that uh, some of the many cases of missing people uh, on this planet every year might be cases where individuals fall through these one-way trap doors into a variety of, of parallel dimensions, including the land of the jinn, and are either unable to find their way back or perhaps they are prevented from finding their way back. Or may be caught in a time dilation and show up 20 years later like Rip Van Winkle. <laughs> oh, that's right. Uh, in this kind of brings me into uh, a a very interesting question from one of our um, uh, proud skeptics uh, (laughs) on the forum. Trained observer calls himself paranormally perplexed. And his question is, ask Phil just how much a believer, and that's italicized, he is in the Jinn legends. From hearing him talk on a recent radio show, he had a true believer sound to a lot of what he was saying. I've always had a lot of respect for Phil's work. Is this a case where he has real evidence that has persuaded him that these things are real and the stories about them have some validity? And if so, what is it? I have to tell you, when people start talking about interdimensional grudges and what have you, I wonder just how much or how this information can be assessed to any reasonable doubt or any reasonable extent. Yes, both. This is something that I'm working on to document. The answer to that question, um, I don't believe in the mumbo jumbo of the jinn. You know, all the um, the Islamic stuff that's you know the magic and the Muslim stuff that goes back to the ancient Persian times, with the magical rituals and all that. There, I'm a scientist, but I do believe that you know there is all this phenomena manifesting into our reality. 
And a great percentage of it is not just the pipe dreams of an overactive imagination of a bored society. People are experiencing something. People who didn't even care about paranormal phenomena are experiencing all of these different things. So it seems that there is this other reality that's close to us. And there seems to be an intelligence in this other reality that's close to us. We go back and we can find out that, yes, the Muslim people, the Persian people before that, they did believe in this other reality and that it was inhabited by beings. So I'm saying right now is that, you know, you have to open your mind to it. I'm presenting evidence and I'm presenting stories and evidence that I've acquired in the Middle East. And Rosemary and I have done in a lot of our investigations into the jinn and attaching the folklore to modern times and even paranormal phenomena in the UFO phenomena with this idea of uh, dimensional beings in the multidimensional universe. And um, you have to remember also that now it sounds like mumbo jumbo, magic, a lot of wide ideas and so on. But the idea of a dimensional universe may be our science of the late 21st and 22nd century. Back in the 1700s, the idea of space travel would have been considered pipe dreams and the ravings of fanatics. But today, it's a fact. So I think the human, human race is once again on the verge of a, a new awareness into the true nature of the universe. And we just can't dismiss anything. We have to consider that the legends of our ancestors, some of it reflected real experiences. I applaud that answer, and that's uh, I, I'm taking notes because when I'm asked that, I want to be able to be as eloquent as you were in uh, in answering that question, because well, as you Rosemary, should, you should catch me on a better day, on a good day. <laughs> you know? That was good though, and as Rosemary knows uh, as well as uh, Jean, that by going out and being active in this field and you know exposing yourself to people that have had extraordinary experiences you really have to be as objective as possible and and the question is whether you believe in the jinn legends obviously you don't believe in them uh, by literal definition but boy you sure take into account that this is a cross cultural phenomenon in terms of various cultures have their own descriptions uh, that seem to be describing something very similar so it, it's not something that you can just discount. I think it does give us a, uh, a leg up on an investigative process that we're, that we're going through here. Another question that, that came up uh, in my mind has to do with uh, just the whole idea of what is the tipping point? The jinn obviously have not been able to, you know, go in with the assumption that there is some reality behind this. They haven't gotten to a tipping point where they're able to manifest control you know, in a in a a large way over humankind and human culture, but uh, what do you envision is the is sort of their goal in terms of trying to regain control of of Earth or this reality? What do you think it's going to take for them to actually get there? Is it the human race annihilating itself and they kind of win by default, or is there some proactive thing that they can do? short of that to uh, to have control. I think there's two trains of thoughts with the Jinn society. At one time, Jinn interacted and coexisted with human beings on this planet. Each respected the other's space, so to speak, and, and there was some contact back and forth. I believe that um, some of the more established Jinn hope that this is going to happen again someday, but they have to wait to a point to until the human race reaches a certain level of understanding and development. Because right now, we would consider them invaders. But there is another faction of jinn that only has one idea. The only way that they could come back in this world is get rid of the competitors, and that's extinguish every human soul on this planet, or knock down the population to a certain number and enslave us. There are many beliefs. There are many beliefs over in the Middle East with not only clerics and holy men, but also people who are involved with the sciences over there that consider the dimensional idea. And believe it or not, I mean, it's almost a scary thought. There's almost the idea that the jinn are establishing beachheads for an invasion. 
And another thing to keep in mind, Chris, is we really don't know the extent of their activities among us because they are the hidden ones, and uh, they're very good at disguising themselves. So we have probably only the tip of the iceberg noticeable to us now in, in the most standout kinds of examples and cases. I'll tell you what, we'll get into more of those cases and more of this discussion about whether they are trying to do us harm right now. We have Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip Imbrogno. It's the vengeful gin we're talking about. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over five years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light System today, complete with two black Berkey elements for only $220. And the Berkey Guy will include three sport Berkey water bottles and ship everything to you free of charge. That's right, three sport Berkey water bottles and free shipping. An $87 value, yours free. Call the Berkey Guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653. Or order online at GoBerkey.com. That's GoBerkey.com today. There's mounting evidence suggesting that there are people, governments, corporations, and whole professions intent on short-circuiting humanity's well-being. GMO, food legislation protecting big agriculture, the attempted elimination of vitamins and alternative medicines, it seems their hand has been tipped. They want to dictate your health, wealth, and your longevity. Whatever the outcome, we have a solution. Wild edible food. Why worry about food when all has been provided? We imagine that we were ejected from the garden and never invited back, but the garden's still here. There is an endless wild abundance which grows all over our green earth, just waiting for you to wake up and see it. Let author Linda Runyon teach you how to see, know, get, prepare, store, and eat wild edible food. Save money, add nutrition, and ignore the noise when you go shopping in nature's supermarket. Go to ofthefield.com and get started today. Or call 1-888-51-EAT-FREE. That's ofthefield.com or call 1-888-51-EAT-FREE and begin to see a different world. Extend your life with Extend Hi, my name's Russ, and after my heart attack, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I needed to keep on working, but now it's becoming a problem. I heard about these garlic cayenne drops and hoped it would help me. Well, I've been taking them for about four months, and the way I'm feeling now, I can see how I just might make it to retirement, thanks to Extendivite. My name's Don Wiskin, and I want you to know Extendivite works. If you're looking for more energy or just want to be as healthy as you can, now is the time to join the growing list of real people benefiting from Extendivite. To order, call 1-877-928-8822. That's 1-877-928-8822. Or visit our website at heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network.
This is Kurt Seven, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. We have Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Phil Imbrock. No, the vegetable gin is on the table for discussion. Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Now, Rosemary, you had started this discussion about things they might be doing to do us harm. Do you think any of the conflicts we see around the world are caused not by our own warring nations or tribes, but by them? It's certainly possible, and we've collected some cases uh, that we also think are the tip of an iceberg uh, in terms of returning American servicemen from the Middle East who are uh, seem to be coming home with gin attachments. And uh, whether that just sort of happens to them in the circumstances of combat or whether um, there are uh, our own mortal enemies who are able to marshal the jinn in ways against us remains to be known. But I suspect that it happens more than we realize. And, of course, some of the servicemen who come home with lots of trauma, there are a lot of things going on in addition to to what seem to be gin attachments. But uh, they could certainly be taking advantage of a lot of our natural conflicts. We have to be open to the speculation that there are human forces and agencies who are able to uh, collaborate uh, with the jinn or even co-op the gin in some way to work for them, sort of as invisible mercenary for them. Wow, that brings up a very interesting point, and uh, one that I raised in my book, Stalking the Tricksters, and that is that there seems to be a kind of a school of thought in the Middle East that, you know, this Western aggression uh, that appears to be going on as we speak right now, look at Libya, Western aggression in the Middle East may be gin inspired. Uh, I think that there's. I'm, <laughs> let's put it this way. I think that uh, I. It wouldn't uh, surprise me if a fair number of people in the Middle East that that believe in the gin and have a you know a deeper understanding of the concept uh, than we do in the West would equate gin activity to uh, you know the type of. Uh, political strife that uh, has been instigated by the Western powers in the Middle East. Now, I know that's an overly simplistic uh, <laughs> kind of hypothesis, but what do you think of that? I mean, Phil, you were over there. Do you know people in the Middle East think that there's somehow a jinn influence uh, on American foreign policy there? Well, they do believe that jinn have taken control over certain villages and towns in Syria and Iraq, and in Oman and some of the other Arab countries. And they also believe that certain jinn have made deals, three wishes, so to speak, with certain political leaders and also certain um, rebel leaders, rabble rousers, religious leaders, to give them power and to manipulate situations so they can get into power. And, of course, for what they want is the the human race to be in total discord so they can make it easier for them to come into our world and take control. So you have all of these stories, and then you have all of these other strange stories about jinn entering our dimension and the government trying to capture one, the governments of the world. So, I mean, what is really going on? I mean, is, are, is, the, is this a psychosis of the 21st century that we have to blame it on all our problems on dimensional beings? Or are these <laughs> dimensional beings really existing and causing all this? And it seems that all of this is happening in the Middle East. Every time we look at it, another country is breaking out with riots. And uh, this is exactly the way I heard the jinn would operate. They would yeah, make deals with certain leaders and give them power in order to do this so they can gain control. But in the end, the jinn wants his pain, and who knows what that's going to be. It's not going to be good for the person they made the deal with or the human race. But if the jinn are so powerful, and I don't really understand this to this day, and certainly listening to this discussion, they're so powerful, why do they need to work behind the scenes? Where can't they just break through the dimensional barrier and just take us over? 
Well, because well, first of all, it's not all the jinn. There is a there is a certain number of jinn that want to coexist with the human race, and they're waiting for the time for it to happen. There is a a, a smaller number of jinn, almost terrorist like jinn. We no, call, I understand know, the point the of the jinn, terrorist jinn. The good jinn, Phil, the Phil. bad jinn, and the very bad jinn. But you I see, the power is limited. Phil, I understand that. I understand that we have good jinn and bad jinn from what you said before. The question here is though. The factions that are evil, are they being kept under control by the authorities, by the good jinn, or what? They're probably checked from time to time, but their power is limited. They don't have unlimited power. When they expel power, they have to rest, just like a, you, you know, you going to work and or going out and cutting the grass. After you do that, you need to take a rest. When they expel energy, they have to rest and rebuild the resources up. And uh, the human race, it, it, I mean, our world is so involved with so much technology and so many people. They really don't have the power just to come in and wipe us all out. They have to do it. They're coming in and they're doing it through our own. Plus, they're being checked. So that they don't have limitless power, but they have more power than human beings do. And they do have power, but it's not, it has a limit to it. Okay, now, the good gen, the ones who want to coexist with humans... Where do we reach the point where that can happen? Do we have to get all the tribes, the warring tribes on this planet to be a little bit more cooperative before that happens? What? I would think that uh, they're waiting for a point. See, uh, according to the ancient beliefs, jinn are afraid of humans, and humans were afraid of jinn. One of the things they're afraid of is that human beings are very violent, and they're unpredictable. And um, the jinn see this aggression as sooner or later human beings enslaving them again. And um, so there's, there's, there's a distrust between humans and jinn. And, of course, they're lost in our legend, so no, people don't think about them anymore. But most jinn still remember humans, and they still distrust them. But you have to remember, there are probably also many jinn who have never encountered humans. To them, humans are just a legend. They don't believe in us, and we don't believe yeah, in them. Yeah, we don't believe in us, we don't believe in you. <laughs> Good but, point. You know, I mean, Chris, any so, more know, questions like from the forums? Sword. Yeah, go ahead, Phil. Sorry, uh, we cut you off there. Go ahead. Yeah, finish oh, no, up, I'm Phil, saying, and then we'll ask questions. Go ahead. Yeah, it's like a double-edged sword. You know, I mean, you know, you, you have to take into account that, you know, the psyche of the human race and the psyche of the gender, both free-willed beings, Throughout the ages, they have grown this distrust for each other, and um, and there is a faction of jinn. I, I really don't call them the good; they're the indifferent. They're hoping one day that they can coexist with human beings once again, and and there is and there is certain number of jinn that would destroy them. I mean, if if, if a certain number of jinn came into our world with their power and everything, don't you think that certain governments of the world would try to exploit them? Yeah. I mean, well, that, they that, fear us. Well, that, that leads me to to Philip Dean's question, and, and we kind of touched on this before, but uh, could you ask Phil if he thinks the military units assigned to track or capture the jinn have had any success? In other words, have they ever captured a jinn? Also, is this just confined to uh, U.S. activity? I think you answered that before by saying that the Saudis were – were implicated in, in uh, at least those two instances that you cited about about military units showing up uh, uh, during a gin sighting. Uh, but do you think that there has been any success in this regard? And and what would be the motivation? Do you think for uh, the U.S. to be going over to the Middle East uh, trying to capture a gin? I just want to point out before we get started here that we're about to break for our final break for the session. So hold that and answer about whether we have captured a jinn, and where would they be? Are they being kept on ice? Is it kind of like the legends of Roswell? Gets to be very interesting. The forums we keep mentioning on the show where we're asking all those questions, that's forum.paracast.com. That's forum.paracast.com. It's very easy to join up. You give yourself a unique username, then you can participate. And when we have the question bank feature for an upcoming guest, you can ask the questions, and we try to get to most of them. Sometimes we have too many questions, but we do our best. Phil and Brogno joining us, Rosemary Ellen Guiley. The book is The Vengeful Gin. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. 
Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many forms. Formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code Night Owl. Use the coupon code Night Owl to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L E M K E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L E M K E Soft.com. The food storage industry leader has done it again. Introducing FDG Clubs and Survival Bucks from the Freeze Dry Guy. For over 39 years, the Freeze Dry Guy has served various government agencies and the private sector with the finest in storable foods and emergency rations. If you've wanted to build emergency food supplies but couldn't afford it, now you can. Go to freezedryguy.com, click on products, and look for the Freeze Dry Guy Clubs to pay as you go. Now you can build food storage without going into debt. Choose from a payment range of $95 to $450 per month. Month. Our clubs work with everyone's budget. Plus, when you join Freeze Dry Guy Clubs, you'll get additional rewards. For example, this month, get 10% back in survival bucks on all purchases in the Freeze Dry Guy product line, plus free shipping within the lower 48 states on any order amount. Hurry, go to freezedryguy.com or call 866-404-3663. That's freezedryguy.com or call 866-404-3663. The Freeze Dry Guy, the best you can buy. If you owe the IRS money you can't pay, then listen carefully because you already know that the problem won't go away by itself. You can get help today from the leading tax expert in the country, Dan Pilla. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. The IRS isn't going to just forget about you. Right now, the IRS is hiring thousands of tax collectors to go after delinquent accounts just like yours. That's why you need to take action today and I can help. I take a simple but proven approach to solving your tax debt problem. First, I stabilize collections so you don't have to worry about wage and bank levies. Next, I build a detailed plan to get your debt reduced to the fullest extent possible, sometimes even eliminated. Finally, I work with you every step of the way to get your problem solved once and for all. So call now for a free consultation. Call 1-800-346-6829. Dan Pilla will solve your tax problem guaranteed. He's helped thousands of people, and he can help you too. Call us today at 800-346-6829. That's 800-34-NO-TAX. How well and how fast does heart and body extract work to improve blood circulation? Listen. My name is Ellis, and I am 66 years old, and I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Two years ago, I was diagnosed as having clogged arteries. I had 70% blockage in one artery leading to my heart. They wanted me to go on Plavix, but I refused, knowing the negative side effects. Heart and Body Extract is a unique balance, synergy, and proportion of herbs reaching from head to toe at maximum absorption around 95% at the cellular level. Within the first month, I felt a dramatic difference. The heaviness in my legs was reduced, and within two months, I felt completely normal. Your natural organic herbal formula for heart health is Heart and Body Extract. Heart and Body Extract comes with a 100% ironclad money-back guarantee. Details at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305 for Heart and Body Extract. Call 866-295-5305. 866-295-5305 for Heart and Body Extract. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. This is Hilly Rose, and I hope that you do listen to the Paracast because you will learn a great deal about the paranormal. We have one more segment with Philip Imbrogno, Rosemary Ellen Guiley. The vengeful gin is our topic. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. So, Phil, we left that question on the table. Have we captured a gin? When I was in the Middle East in Saudi Arabia and I was at the dinner table with a member of the royal family, my cousin, 
um, I asked him, and he told me of the operation of, of you know trying to cash the gin, capture a gin, the gate to take out. I asked him, has a gin ever been captured? And he said he did not know because the matter is of the highest security, and he wouldn't be privileged to that information. So I have to go with that. I don't know if they actually captured one or not, but you do hear rumors about, let's say, our government and other governments of the world, main powers, making deals with, you know, certain type of entities who are dimensional in nature and so on. So it may, be, it may be possible that, you know, the, the governments of the world, some governments of the world, some leaders of the world have made deals with them and had communication with them. But whether or not they've actually captured one and have one on ice, I couldn't tell you. Like a Faustian bar- bargain. It's probably as elusive as the alleged ETs that we've supposedly captured. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Well, uh, I have another question here. I, I happen to post a very interesting article written by um, a, a, kind of a bit of a rabble rouser in the UFO field, Ant- Anthony Bregalia. And uh, the last question that I have here is from JT, and he says, given uh, Phil's military background, I'd be interested to hear his thoughts and insights on the National Reconnaissance Office. Uh, Bregalia's article goes into some uh, pretty interesting uh, questions about, uh, you know, who actually has been monitoring UFO activity on this planet. And, of course, the NRO would be um, kind of the the hidden agency that might uh, be sitting on quite a wealth of data. What what do you know about the NRO, and uh, what do you think, Phil? Do you think they've uh, they've got some smoking gun evidence? I don't know. You know, I have to remember my military experience was was you know somewhat limited to operations in Cambodia during the Vietnam War. So um, I never really came across UFO documents or UFO information in that nature. But during my investigations as a UFO investigator, especially during the Hudson Valley case, uh, I was contacted by the Air Force directly regarding the sightings, and I was the first civilian contacted directly by the Air Force since Project Blue Book closed down. So I imagine, and, and, and the people who contacted me were just obviously getting information for somebody else. They were front for somebody else. So, uh, you know, I see a certain aspect of the government, and the government's a big word, but there are probably uh, very, very, you know, small units of uh, of operations that uh, uh, are in the government uh, collecting information on UFOs. That, that, that's obvious from the contacts that I've, I've had over the years with uh, people from the NSA and the CIA and so on. And uh, some of my investigations that I've run into brick walls and actually uh, been threatened at times, um, telling me to back off, especially when I was investigating the sightings at the Indian Point Nuclear Reactor in Buchanan, New York, where the sightings were verified. Uh, I was told to back down. So there are very strong arms in in the United States government that are, are monitoring this. Okay, well, that's it for uh, my questions, Gene, in in terms of our forum uh, uh, posters. Well, I'm going to ask you folks, because we have a few minutes left, Rosemary or Phil, either one of you can answer this question, which is where should we go in terms of scientific investigation to try to get more information about this? Because obviously if we have creatures from another dimension who want to take over, want to interact with us and do us harm, We've got to do something to combat that. So, Rosemary, Phil, who wants to answer that? What do we do? Well, one thing that we can do, and Phil can address this from a scientific perspective, first of all, we have to have information and knowledge, which is one of the reasons why we wrote the book, to inform people what we think is going on uh, and to make people aware of uh, the fact that uh, we are engaging with entities and they may not be who we think they are. Um, We have been working on some equipment that uh, Phil has been very innovative with in in developing in terms of um, trying to identify the places where these entities are most likely to manifest and how we can communicate with them. Uh, And uh, we need to experiment with different ways for um, interacting with them and also preventing problems. 
in the cases we've uh, looked into, there is no one universal remedy. People have to experiment with a variety of things to find out what is effective for them, and that may have to do with the, uh, uh, the nature of their consciousness, the situation, and the power and objectives of the gin they're interacting with. Bill, do you want to... Uh yeah, well, you know, the, the, the first thing we have to do is identify where they're coming in because they're hidden. And when you have a portal open up, a dimensional portal, you're going to have a flood of elementary particles coming in. These particles interact with matter in our universe, and devices can be constructed to detect it. As a matter of fact, we've already got prototypes for it. Um, it's a long story, but it's it's in the new book, and uh, it's quite promising right now. It's a long scientific explanation, but it has to do with the interaction of uh, elementary particles on electrons in, in our reality to produce a, a pattern showing where the portal is opening up. And, and this is not all magic and all wah-wah wonderland. This is all, you know, based on um, theoretical physics, modern theoretical physics, and uh, work that I've been doing up at MIT. Yeah, it, it, there was a question here actually that I, I missed, and it, and it was uh, again from trained observer. Asked Phil to elaborate on some of the technical aspects of his instrumentation project, and what you're trying to detect and how. And it sounds like this will be a perfect subject for when you guys uh, come back f uh, for your next visit. Uh, we can talk about uh, some of these attempts uh, at designing the instrumentation, some of the protocols that you would uh, put in place. And also, I must mention that uh, I'm looking forward to uh, doing a field trip with Rosemary up to the San Luis Valley here this spring uh, to a couple of spots that I've, uh, I think I've identified as being, <laughs> uh, I think, by a loose definition, uh, a location-specific portal spot, if you will. Where, fast uh, question, all... Chris. Fast question. Does that mean we'll have an on-the-scene Powercast episode. It's it's up to Rosemary <laughs> and hey, whether I can I'm, uh, get I'm the time off. It would be great. It. You know, I'm yeah. so excited about this because uh, Chris, your work uh, in the San Luis Valley has been so intriguing to me. It's a place I want to, wanted to return to to do more research and to be able to do that uh, with you um, in all these hot spots. And I think this fits the profile of a gin area too. Oh yeah, uh, I think it's just going to be great. So I, I would definitely be up for uh, seeing what we could do show-wise on that. We're just about out of time, guys. So we'll be updating our listeners as to how this trip manifests itself, what kind of show we can set up, and whether I'll be talking to Chris and Rosemary and suddenly they'll disappear. <laughs> into that, or that appear in your, your house. <laughs> <laughs> they'll go into the dimensional warp, you know, the window area, the anomaly. Whatever. Rosemary Ellen Guiley, where can we find more of the things you do? Uh, two websites. My main website is visionaryliving.com, www, one word, visionaryliving.com. And then Phil and I have set up a brand new website called Gin Universe, and that's djinnuniverse.com, as uh, a, a place not only to publicize the book, but to set up uh, some information and education about the gin, and we invite reader comments and reader experiences. That's a great way for people to um, learn what's going on and to validate their own experiences and reevaluate them from the standpoint of gin. Next week, we'll have Benjamin Radford. We'll be talking on the Paracast about the Chupacabra, real or fantasy, on a future episode, we'll be featuring none other than Jesse Ventura. Chris O'Brien, where do we find more of your stuff? Well, I'm at theforum.theparacast.com, and also I have a website, ourstrangeplanet.com. And I want to thank Rosemary and Phil for being on the show. This has been very uh, enlightening. I think it's going to stimulate a lot of conversation on our forums, and we look forward to having you guys back. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you both tonight. A super pleasure. A gin pleasure. Paracast is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in The Paracast.